Thank you very much for this invitation and the opportunity to discuss these very interesting topics as seen from different points of view. I think this is very fruitful. And my contribution will be on the side of cosmology. So we now move into the extremely large scale uh, compared to the previous talk. <laughs> and uh, we will uh, see uh, what right now is uh, the status of our ability to actually see uh, the early stage of the universe and what is being uh, put forward in terms of uh, effort, experimental effort, to, um, to go even beyond. And uh, so let's start with a very familiar view, or let's say what used to be a very familiar view, the, 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 the sky, and ask, you know, how far can we actually see? I mean, this is a very old, ancient question. And now we have new tools and new answers to, to, this, to this question. Now, of course, this, uh, this uh, ability to look into the sky, into the universe, into the large uh, scale depends on the frequency range in which we are looking at things. For example, if you look at uh, this region that appears uh, in this way to our eyes and you look at it in the infrared, it looks completely different. Yeah. You have uh, interstellar dust that, that uh, uh, is emitting in the uh, infrared, which is completely invisible uh, to our eyes. And in fact, if you look at a, a generic region in the universe, and you ask how many photons are there and at, at different frequencies, you, you can construct a sort of a global spectrum. And uh, this is the peak that is due to all the stars in the universe, okay? But then there is much more. There is infrared, as we just saw. There is a radio emission. Uh, and then there are high uh, energy uh, photons, ultraviolet, uh, X-ray, gamma ray. And we more or less now understand which are the main sources that produce these photons in the universe, okay? Um, now, Let's uh, uh, look with the eye of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope into the depth of the universe. We, we know that all the stars that we see by naked eye are within our galaxy. And uh, this is now moving us in the certain region here in the sky uh, where this map has been uh, constructed, which is the deepest map of faraway galaxies. Now, every point that you see appearing, they are not stars, but each of them is a galaxy. So it contains hundreds of billions of stars. And now we are reaching the uh, famous image that was already shown yesterday, which is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a very tiny region in the sky. There's nothing special about that, that region, except it's a very clean region in terms of interstellar space and interstellar medium, and we have something like 10,000 galaxies. Every point is a galaxy except for this one and uh, this one, which are two fore uh, foreground stars. And, uh, and the further uh, galaxies that we see here uh, are something like 12 to 13 billion light years away. Okay, so this is light that is reaching us today after 13 billion years of traveling into space. So that means that the sample of the universe that we observe through those galaxies is a, a universe of 13 billion years ago. And since we know that uh, uh, the universe is expanding and we, uh, we can estimate the time of the beginning of the expansion in about 14 billion, light, uh, 14 billion years, it means that those galaxies were very uh, young, in a very young universe. And the question is, is there something that is coming from even further away, such that we can actually see the universe as it was closer to the beginning of the expansion? And the answer is yes. And that's amazing, right? I mean, this is happy. This, we know this since about 50 years. Um, there was a incredible discovery uh, by these two uh, gentlemen, Penzias and Wilson, in 65. By chance, 
so to speak, they stamped into the signal, a microwave signal that was coming not from any particular place, but from everywhere, from every region in the sky. And they were surprised to see that uh, there was uh, this signal of about 3 Kelvin in terms of antenna temperature that uh, uh, was later understood and interpreted as light that uh, is really coming from a very early stage of the universe. And so in one uh, snapshot, this is the picture that we have of the universe. The Earth is not at the center in a, let's say, in a Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic sense, of course, but because of uh, isotropy and uniformity, anywhere we would be in the universe, we would have an observer-centered spherical symmetry around us, okay? And the further we go uh, uh, in space and the more we go back into the past until we reach a time when the temperature of the universe was so high that the atoms were not uh, staying together and uh, there was a plasma era in the first uh, um, 380,000 years. And the photons that uh, uh, Penzias and Wilson observed, the cosmic microwave background, reaches us from everywhere in the celestial sphere and gives us an image of what was the universe back then. And so by studying the details of what uh, this uh, ancient light is uh, uh, showing, we can even infer things th that happened uh, in the plasma era early beyond uh, uh, that uh, uh, last scattering surface. And so uh, this is really a matter of great, of great interest and of great uh, uh, experimental effort. Now, if we add uh, the uh, spectrum, the black body spectrum that was soon uh, uh, realized was a very good the black body spectrum, the light of this ancient light, uh, and we add uh, to the rest of the photons in the universe, we see that it is uh, standing, standing out. And in fact, 95% of, of the photons, uh, of the energy uh, uh, in terms of uh, electromagnetic energy in the universe is in this very faint uh, light, which, however, fills every corner of the universe, and so it is uh, uh, um, dominating. Now, however, we are not in a, in a generic region in the universe, fortunately. Otherwise, we do, wouldn't have a sun and, a, and we wouldn't have a life. We are within a galaxy, and, and the gal within a galaxy, we are about here, and so but to look for uh, photons that reach us from the uh, very far universe, we have to remember that we are embedded in sources that also confuse the view to some extent. Okay, so in fact, if uh, you do the same uh, um, exercises before, but now from our specific point of view, this is now in terms of brightness, temperature, and this is the black body of the cosmic microwave background, well, now you have a, a much more contributions from local uh, emitters. And so you have free-free uh, and synchrotron at low frequencies and thermal dust at high frequency. Fortunately, however, uh, there is a window around uh, 70 to 100 gigahertz, uh, which means a few millimeters of wavelength, where this Primordial light is dominating, so we actually can observe that. It's, that's interesting to notice that if our star in the galaxy, instead of being here, which you see is between two arms of the spiral, was more inside one of these two arms, we probably could not see the cosmic microwave background. We would be completely dominated by local radiation. So we are lucky. We are in a nice position in the, in the universe and in the galaxy. Or I would say in the galaxy, because the universe at large scale, as we saw, is, is uh, isotropic. Okay? So we need to look in this region to have high precision measurement of this light and make images. And so the Planck satellite, that I've been working on that for 26 years now, so I'm, uh, I can tell you some of the latest results, which are going to be Soon, the last ones, in a few months, uh, everything will be uh, completed in terms of the whole, um, pro uh, the whole project. 
Okay, so the Planck uh, satellite was designed, you see, to cover many frequencies. Why? Well, because we had to distinguish the, the microwave background from local radiation. And only by using the leverage of the spectral signature you can do that, okay? So that's a, a very important thing. And in fact, as you will see, there are two instruments. Not one technology can do all of these frequencies. We have to have two different frequencies, two different technology on board the same satellite. This is the um, Planck uh, telescope, 1.5 meter aperture. This is the focal plane, which is cooled down to um, temperature that reach uh, 0 0.1 Kelvin in the focal plane. So that's an extreme challenge to do that in space. And in fact, it's the first time that it was done in space. And um, the two instruments are here. They are really heavily integrated in the focal plane, which is over there. Uh, it's a project, as I said, that started in 1992 and now. We are at the final release and involved many, many people. Uh, it's a human challenge, not only technologi technological challenge these days to do these large scale projects. Uh, this is what the, the Planck satellite has been doing for four years. Uh, after launch, it was launched in uh, 2009, and then for four years, it continued to observe the sky by scanning every place of the, uh, of the sky uh, like this. It was spinning at one RPM, and then it was following the Earth at the distance of 1.5 million kilometers, so very deep into uh, space. And by scanning like this and following the Earth, which is, of course, moving around the sun, every six months, the angle of the satellite with respect to the sky changes about 180 degrees, right? And so every six months, uh, our scanning strategy covers the entire sky. And since we went on for four years, we have eight different realization, and so we can compare for systematics and uh, consistency, which is obviously very, very important. Uh, now we normally uh, show this in this kind of projection, and this is, of course, the fact that we are within the galaxy. So this is the optical view of uh, what we cannot uh, remove unless, again, we use different frequencies. And in fact, the result, this is obviously an animation. These are real data. And these are the nine different frequencies at which Planck has measured. And uh, you can see that uh, in, in this region, in the middle, at 70 and 100 gigahertz, you have minimal contamination from the galaxy. And a low frequency and a high frequency, you have much more contamination. But the thing is, and I will not go into details, but there is um, very refined work that can be done, really, to put together all this information and disentangle the various components, okay? So the result of all of, the, of that is a clean, full sky map of the microwave background. So this is really a picture in a literal sense, we said the camera is a little strange and a little expensive, but it's the single picture for which this, uh, this uh, Planck camera was realized. Um, actually, there is more, uh, as uh, you will see, but this is the uh, most important. So what do we see here? We see the universe at uh, 380 thousand years, which is 0.003% of the present age. So it's a very young universe. And what we see here is the um, result of physical processes that went on in that plasma era. Let me uh, just say that theory, well before uh, these data were available, already had uh, predicted what should be generically, or let's say, uh, the main feature of the kind of statistical properties of the distribution of these um, regions. Of course, you can see the colors track intensity, okay? When it's red, it's, it's slightly more intense than when it's blue, but the difference is, is only, you, you can see, about 300 microkelvin, okay? So this is very tiny deviation from uniformity. But that tiny deviation is 
the source of all structure in the universe. Okay? And uh, how these uh, differences uh, arose and why do we expect this kind of statistical uh, behavior? You have an uh, angular scale here and you have the degree of anisotropy here. Um, when we launched the Planck, or actually when we uh, designed Planck, the only data available were from Kobe that made the big discovery of the existence of this uh, anisotropy. But then all the rest was based on theory. And why do we expect this kind of behavior? Um, well, let's quickly look uh, qualitatively at the situation. We assume that we start with some primordial perturbation. And, and we, we heard yesterday, you know, we, we, there are good ideas of where this could come from. But what we see really at the last scattering surface at this age is the result of the following. There, are, there is a causal horizon that starting from that very early time, we don't know exactly when, but starting from down there, uh, the uh, um, horizon, of course, grows as the speed of light uh, as light with its speed has the time to reach different regions. And then if there are perturbations at different scales, uh, they, they will start to contract from gravity, but then the um, uh, electrical uh, repulsion of uh, uh, particles uh, would uh, start to act as an elastic force and therefore will, will contract and expand. So there are oscillations, there are acoustic oscillations that will stop uh, when you have a combination of uh, uh, these particles to uh, create uh, neutral atoms. And of course, the number of oscillations depends on the size of the primordial fluctuations. So they will be reaching the, st the time of uh, uh, recombination uh, with different state. And physics is relatively simple physics that tells us uh, what is the um, effect on the photons of this uh, velocity and of this over density. Okay? So by doing that, you can see that the peaks for the density will be when you have maximum density or minimum density. Okay? And then the peaks of, for velocity will be when you have maximum contraction or maximum expansion. And the pattern is, of course, anti-correlated. And so if you sum all of this, this is the reason for expecting this kind of spectrum, okay? But the important thing to, to understand is that the details of these peaks and valley depend on the medium in which these oscillations are happening. And the medium is made of what? <laughs> we can tell what kind of energy, what kind of particles are in there uh, because uh, if we can make a high precision measurement of this spectrum, First of all, we have to verify that it has this shape, but that will tell us more about what is going on in the universe, what are the constituents of the universe, and, and, and much more, okay? So this is just a, once again to illustrate that. If you change some of the key parameters, like in this, ca in this case, the amount of matter uh, in the universe, or the matter density, uh, you have uh, um, different uh, detail of a similar uh, curve, and this is the same uh, if you change curvature or if you change uh, cosmological constant, you see? And of course, there is a lot of information there, and uh, we uh, have a simplest model, which is, by, uh, uh, which is uh, described by si only six parameters, okay? And then from these six parameters, you can extract many other parameters. And then uh, there are extensions uh, that you can uh, test, okay? So in this mo in basic model, we assume a flat universe with no curvature and with uh, no mass for the neutrinos that we just heard, uh, a, a number of neutrinos as in the standard model, and so on. Um, then we can test all of these things depending on how accurate is the measurement, okay? So this is the latest version of the power spectrum as measured by Planck, and there it is. So you see the blue points are the experimental data, 
and the red curve is the best fit model with the, those six free parameters. And this is astonishingly uh, good. I mean, this is, to me, once again, uh, we, we were talking about the existence of physical laws. Here you have an example. You are, we are seeing the match between experimental data of high precision and physics that was going on 14 billion years ago with a mechanism that is subtle and has a very definite prediction. So this is, I think, it's great. Now, again, <laughs> at this point, of course, uh, we, we can, uh, we can uh, estimate with high precision the parameters that give this best fit, okay? Um, and uh, <coughs> so these are the numbers. They are not particularly telling as, as such. But uh, you can see that we have here evidence of uh, um, baryons that were present with a, pre with a given uh, density at 1% level of precision back in the, in the early universe. A very high sigma detection of dark matter. Without dark matter, you couldn't do that. And we know exactly how much, you see, with a very tiny error bar there. Um, this is probing the reionization epoch. I would not comment. It's a very interesting thing, but I don't have time. And this is very important for the very early universe. This is the spectrum of the primordial perturbation, the ones that inflation or any other mechanism in the very early universe uh, introduced to give the start to these oscillations, okay? And, and this is the number, and it's near unity, but a little bit less than unity, and in fact, this is what the preferred uh, uh, value is for uh, most inflation models, and this is one of the reasons of uh, very um, high credit of this inflation idea. Uh, notice, if you look at this number, this H is the Hubble constant, but if you take that into account, baryonic matter and, and uh, cold dark matter uh, make uh, together um, something like 30%, with 25 or 26% of dark matter, 4.9% of baryonic matter, and then there must be something else. Why? Well, because the uh, data pre prefer, uh, and uh, this is written in the, in the standard model, a flat universe, which the total means must be one. And so if the universe is Euclidean, then we have to have something like 70% of something that we believe is dark energy or that we call dark energy. I will come back to that point. Um, Curvature. Uh, the CMB data alone don't have a very good measurement of curvature because there is a high degeneration with other parameters, okay? But uh, as soon as you in, in, include other data sets like baryonic acoustic oscillations, you, you see that the, I, I don't know if you can see it, but you have omega lambda and omega m, okay, uh, which is... Uh, uh, the sum of which essentially is giving the, the um, flatness. And you see the red point here is very small. In fact, the number that you get is amazingly sharply on the Euclidean space. space okay? uh, again, uh, extensions to the model, neutrinos. We just heard uh, the, all the effort from uh, direct measurement. This is a very indirect measurement, but it's a very precise as well. And again, it's about uh, the sum, as we heard, of the masses. It's the only thing we can measure, not the each mass, but the sum of the masses nowadays is less than 0.5 eV. And if you add uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations, it's even less. Uh, and uh, again, the number of species is very in line with the standard model. Uh, I added this slide after the discussion we just had. Here is an example where we can actually experimentally test not the physical law, but a specific crucial part of physical laws, which is physical constant. And in this case, uh, we can show that uh, the uh, uh, 
fine structure constant, which is a combination of very fundamental constants, okay, is uh, constant, is truly constant, within a certain range. But uh, it's interesting that you can uh, look for uh, changes over a very large uh, uh, time interval, such as the age of the universe, almost. Okay? So this is uh, just an example of that. One other thing that uh, I have another, another 20 minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one other wonderful thing that is possible to do uh, with the CMB and uh, was done with Planck uh, is to look for the effect of gravitational lensing of the photons that were released, you, you, you can imagine, back in the background uh, of the universe. These photons cross the entire space, and of course, they, they encounter structures, and structures have mass, and mass bends space. And so these photons change their direction in a way that depends on the integrated gravitational potential in every direction. And that is measurable. Uh, we, we can uh, construct uh, maps uh, that trace the effect of this uh, gravitational lensing. And in fact, this is the kind of picture that, that uh, we get. Uh, this is not the photons. This is, again, a map of the lensing potential. In other words, uh, since we know that the mass is dominated by dark matter, this is telling us how much dark matter there is everywhere in the universe as seen from our point of view, okay? And this power spectrum, you can construct similarly as before, a spectrum, a statistical representation of this uh, distribution, and it uh, uh, fits very well uh, with uh, um, the, uh, it's not shown here, this is the spectrum, but it also fits very well with the uh, expectation from large scale distribution of uh, galaxies and clusters and so on. And the, using this observable, we can al also uh, break degeneracy on some of the parameters that Planck has measured. Now, um, and the, uh, one more thing that is becoming more and more important these days in, the, in cosmology is the, the uh, polarization of these primordial photons. What you see here is a similar um, uh, image as, as before. You can see again the power spectrum of intensity that was discussed so far. But now, now you see also this red curve. This is what the theory expects for the polarized component of these photons, which is expected to be about 10% of the intensity. And this is uh, coming from quadrupolar anisotropy at the last scattering surface. And so it's, it's very simply predicted, directly predicted from the existence of the anisotropy themselves. And again, changing the parameters, uh, that uh, shape changes. Okay. Now, the situation here, uh, look at the, this plot on the right, the situation here for uh, our location in our galaxy uh, is a little less uh, favorable in the sense that uh, polarization, you can see from the synchrotron radiation and from thermal dust in our galaxy, everywhere dominates the CMB. So we have to look for these ancient photons in polarization trying to separate something that is much stronger than, than, than that radiation. So it's a very big challenge. The, the signal is very small. You see here our analysis of systematics uh, in the instrument that is the other enemy, of course, uh, to try to measure this, this kind of spectrum, okay? But with Planck, yes, we did measurement of the polarization. This is a map uh, which is created for all the high frequency channels you can see still the galaxy, okay? So this is not the primordial polarization. This is the sky map as, as it is. And in fact, you can see the galaxy. The colors give you the, the let's say, the amplitude of the signal and, the, and these stripes tell you the direction of the, of, the, of the polarization, which is 
correlated with the magnetic field of our galaxy, OK? Uh, so this is for the high frequency part. So this is essentially dust, interstellar dust that is polarized. And this is the synchrotron at low frequency. And again, you have different structure. So the situation is very complicated, OK? It's very complex uh, because the, the, of the strong galactic signal. Nevertheless, we can construct, and this is now the, the map of the uh, primordial uh, polarization. Now you, you not only see colors, but again here you see these stripes that are indicating the angle at which we see the various uh, regions in the sky. Okay, so again, we can construct power spectra. This is a simulation. This is a simulation that we did in 2005, well before the launch of the satellite. And so you should not look at the details. We didn't know what the parameters were. But look at the um, accuracy in, the, in this multiple range. This is for the EE, so this is the pure polarization. And this is the correlation between polarization and temperature, which, of course, uh, given the common source, is, is a very high correlation and, and directly predictable. So now I can show you the measured power spectra. And you can see them here. And once again, um, high precision. And what is striking here is that the red curve here is not the best fit to those blue points, but is the curve constructed with the parameters that we get only from the temperature, just to make a nasty test, right? You, 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 you don't look at the data. You use the, the th theoretical best fit for only from the temperature, and it fits extremely well also the polarization data. So this is telling us once again that, well, the, the, the data are good, but also that the entire business is correct. I mean, we are talking about something real. <laughs> there is nothing you can say. We, we, very good question. And this is, um, oh. Oh, here, OK. For polarization, the problem there, we are working on that right now. And the problem there is mainly systematics and, uh, systematics and uh, foreground radiation. Uh, you see here, in this region, uh, ideally, you, these systematic effects, you would like to see them going down, just like white noise. This is white noise. But they tend to grow, which is obvious, right? It's very difficult to measure two different parts of the sky with sub-micro Kelvin precision. And so this is where the analysis is more difficult. But also, in terms of uh, foregrounds, is the same. And so that's why in this plot is not shown. But I can show you later, if you like, the status of, of that part. Uh, so uh, parameters, once again, here they are shown. Uh, but this time, uh, the contour plots show both the um, temperature and the polarization. So the, if you compare the red and the green, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, OK, yes, the, red, the, the green is only polarization. The red is only temperature. And the blue is the combination of the two. So polarization uh, allows to uh, improve the precision. But what is even more important, at least to me, is the consistency. That we, we really have evidence that things are making sense. Um, now there is one even more deep uh, pos potential uh, information in this polarization spectrum, which is coming from Another component that was not shown before, which is at some level here, we don't know exactly which one, uh, which is called the B mode as opposed to the E mode here. And the B mode is uh, expected to be present if there were gravitational waves in the very early universe at the time of inflation. And the prediction is that these uh, um, polarized pattern uh, has a, a signature that is uh, uh, distinguishable from the EE as it has a, uh, is not curve free. You can see that there is a rotational component there. And so in principle, this is uh, detectable and distinguishable. Uh, 
uh, we go back in the very early universe at 10 to the minus 35 seconds when perhaps, this is a question mark, I think it's important to remind that we should be open-minded in my opinion about that, but this is the be best hypothesis we have now and if that inflation stage did happen at this time, more or less, then one expects two different signatures in space-time. One, density perturbations, of which we see the effect. We saw them in the intensity pattern. But there is also an imprint in gravitational waves that produce uh, B-mode in the, in the data. And so we need to look for, for that. A um, few years ago, three years ago, uh, something like that, there was a big announcement, and every, many of us remember that, from our colleague in the US who, with the BICEP2, claimed a detection of this pattern. You can see by eye here this curl-like pattern in polarization. And, uh, okay, well, they did this measure. You can see that in the, in, the, in the power spectrum. They did measurement at only one frequency. And it was done in a very clean region, but, of course, uh, with no ability of remove a possible uh, foreground from our galaxy. And with Planck uh, in the following months, uh, well, we could show that indeed uh, the dust polarized contamination from our galaxy could well account for that signature. So uh, once again, the, you know, the, we are in a good location in our galaxy but we have to be extremely careful and respect the limits that nature gives us in the observability of what's around us. Um, with Planck, we put a limit on the existence of these B modes that were not detected. Um, and this R parameter is the ratio between the density and the tensor mode of the polarization. And the uh, limit is, uh, was 0.1. For, for Planck, and then by, it was interesting because we started a collaboration, in fact, with the BICEP2 group, and we put together our data. This is something interesting. In science, this happens, you know. There is competition, but then you really want to, to know how things are. And so we, we could put together the two teams, and nowadays, by combining, this is even more recent, actually, but combining Planck with uh, BICEP2 and Keck, this limit is down to 0 0.07. As far as today, there is no detection of these uh, uh, B modes. And in fact, uh, the most, uh, let's say, um, natural, uh, at least according to some theoreticians, natural inflationary models are already ruled out by this, OK? So that's an interesting situation. You should pay attention to this. Of course, this is not ended. We are really in the middle of a big effort, a post-Planck effort to go after CMB polarization as it can um, attack such fundamental uh, questions and observables. Uh, the US is, is uh, uh, promoting a huge effort which is going on mainly in two sides from the ground, observing from the ground in a small region of the sky with a satellite you can easily look at the entire sky, but this is not the case from the ground, but yet it's extremely important. And uh, uh, one site is in the Atacama Desert in Chile at high altitude, and the other one is at the South Pole with new instruments. Uh, the technology has been uh, progressing incredibly since the Planck instruments were frozen for launch, and so now we are looking at new generation of, of experiments. Here in Europe, uh, we are working very actively also with my, my group and all the, many of the Planck uh, uh, collaborators in other experiments. Uh, and there is a very good uh, opportunity to use the Tenerife Observatory in uh, Canary Islands. Uh, there are a number of experiments that we are planning. This is the one that we are working on, mostly led by Italy, but there is another one from Spain and from Japan, and we, again, we will uh, share to some extent, but uh, truly, our results and, and our data in the end. And there are also um, attempts to identify a new generation space mission on the CMB. 
uh, there has been a, num a number of proposals from Europe, from uh, the European Space Agency, uh, or to the European Space Agency, and to NASA. Uh, but they, so far, they were not accepted. And uh, this is uh, also related to the still very recent completion of Planck. Okay, so we are <laughs> just the day after Planck, or not even. Uh, there is one mission that is now being uh, studied in detail, which is uh, Japanese, and we have a, a collaboration from Europe and from the uh, United States. It's called Lightbird, and if this goes ahead, we will know in a year from now, and uh, the launch is predicted in 2026, and the main driver is again CMB, uh, B-mode polarization. So just to conclude, I hope I was not, uh, okay, good. Uh, so it's remarkable. I, you know, I, I preparing this this conversation, I, I did realize once again, or the more deeply, how remarkable it is uh, to have the opportunity to observe the universe back in time to a primordial state, certainly and with high precision at the last scattering surface where we see this CMB. But then indirectly, we might be able to to probe the very tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And this is just the idea of that possibility is, great, is, is amazing to me. Uh, and this is also due to our local situation. In, in, within our galaxy, we, if we were slightly off, we probably could predict the existence of the CMB because we could see the expansion, we could see many other things, but we could not see the CMB. Okay, so we are lucky for that. Also, I did not, uh, uh, I did not uh, um, emphasize, but if you remember the plot I was showing you, it turns out that nature is kind also in another sense, that the synchrotron radiation and the dust emission have a minimum, by chance, if you like, in a region where the peak of the CMB, which is about 300, uh, which is about 3 Kelvin, at this cosmological time, when we exist, is right there. Okay? Otherwise, once again, we would be probably blind to the window into the early universe. Uh, with Planck, we have the, so far, the most accurate full sky map of the early universe, and the standard Lambda CDM model is confirmed with spectacular precision. But, once again, it's a funny situation. Very high precision, but we don't know most of what we are talking about. 95% is unknown in, uh, in uh, physical uh, nature. So it's a similar, perhaps, situation to the standard model of, uh, of particles, where we know things with very high precision, but we know that there is still something fundamental that we are missing. Okay. Um, we, N nevertheless, with, the, with this measurement, we do measure cosmological parameter with high precision, and there is very nice um, agreement with independ completely independent methods to, to measure less precisely, but with completely independent methods, we measure the same parameters. Once again, that makes you feel you are touching something real about the universe. Um, and with Planck, we also put new limits, and now with other experiments, new limits on inflation physics. And uh, clearly now this uh, game is still ongoing and the next generation of CMB polarization experiment will test how far we can go with the, this ability to actually probe the early, the early universe. Thank you very much.